What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. How are we doing today? I hope everybody is having a great week and staying safe. So anyways, if you're new here, hi, I'm Sydney. Every single Thursday I sit down and I talk about the craziest true crime in every single state, the one that spoke out to me the most. So if you like true crime, you should subscribe, like, tell your friends, you know, that whole thing. I don't really have a set intro. I've been trying out new things and I don't really like anything, so. We're just gonna be all over the place, and you know, we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to get used to it, cause I don't really, I don't really know what I'm doing. So, you know, we're just gonna go ahead and get started, and this is the death of Anne Marie Fahey in Delaware. So, on January 27th, 1966, Anne Marie Fahey was born in Wilmington, Delaware. She was one of uh, six siblings. She had one sister and four brothers. Her family life was pretty bad because her mom passed away pretty early in her life due to cancer. And then because of this, her father fell into like severe alcoholism. Due to um, her father falling into alcoholism, it was said that he became very aggressive and just overall really awful to the siblings. But the significant age gap that Anne-Marie had with her siblings was ridiculous. All of her siblings were out in college or they had families of their own with kids and she was still in high school so she would come home and because he wasn't working all of the lights were shut off and the water and everything she had no electricity he just was spending all of his money on alcohol and wouldn't provide for her. Anne Marie was babysitting um, a family's kids at the time and she was very, very, very close to this family. And they actually offered her a place to stay. Um, they said, we have an extra room. You should come, you should live with us. You can take care of the kids. And you know, we're just, I understand your circumstances. So just come live with us and we'll give you a better life. She was obsessed with her new home. She wanted to absolutely keep everything spotless, her room clean and she just didn't want to mess up this situation because she was so grateful for this family that you know had offered her a place to stay and helped her because of this new family taking her in she almost felt really guilty that she was having to like live underneath their roof and eat their food and she just wouldn't eat sometimes because they're already giving her a bed and everything like that so she's just i don't want to mess up anything so she would often like not eat and starve herself and marie just didn't want to be a burden on the family so she would often go to sleep without eating and this kind of started a very small eating disorder. Thankfully, her brothers um, offered her to come and live with them. They were like, hey, instead of living with this family, you should come live with us and we'll provide and we'll take care of you. And so she eventually moved in with her brothers and she had a really great life and she became like really close to them. Going into adulthood, Anne-Marie was very successful despite all of her childhood hardships and she really enjoyed government. She went off to college and uh, learned Spanish and she actually studied abroad in Spain for a year and she really wanted to work in the foreign sector of government and she was on the right path to do so. In 1993, Anne-Marie actually became the secretary of the governor, Tom Carper, and she absolutely loved her job and she loved the governor. She loved working for him. Getting this position was helping her work her way up into getting into the foreign sector of the government. She loved local government, she loved her job, and this was really just an overall exciting job for her. However, in 1994, this was the year that she had met a man named Tom Campano. You know, he was also in local government and a love affair started. Thomas was born October 11th of 1948 and he came from a very wealthy family. His dad was a real estate business contractor and they were just really well off and they, the family just provided for the kids and gave them so much all the time and he was just a spoiled kid. So he graduated from Boston Law School and received his law degree and married his college sweetheart named Kathleen, who was also known as Kay, and they had four daughters together. Thomas was very charming, very intelligent, and everybody thought he was attractive and thought, you know, obviously he's more attractive because he has a lot of money. Even though Thomas was really well known uh, as a lawyer and just a, a big person in the political aspect, he was making good money, but his parents were still providing money for him and giving him money to help out with the kids and just, 
he was just spoiled into it even into his adulthood like with his wife and his kids still getting money from his parents because they just had so much money to give and they wanted to help out the grandchildren mostly. In 1981, Thomas actually met a lady named Deborah McIntyre. He was married and she was a wife of a co-worker that was at the same law firm as him. The two met at a New Year's Eve party and he like obviously was there with his wife. She was there with his coworker. He was like, hey, I think you're attractive, but we should hook up. We should start an affair. And this started a long affair of about 15 years. So both partners are married, both having an affair, but Thomas actually met Anne Marie at a, um, special event that A had for local government and he was like, I want her and he started to pursue her like a little too much. Anne Marie was 14 years younger than Thomas and he still decided that he was gonna pursue her and the couple would go on lunch dates and special events together for local government and it was always more of a friendship thing at first is what Anne Marie would state. like. You know, this was just friendship, it's not anything romantic, um, he's, he doesn't want me, I'm too young, and stuff like that. But lunches turned into dinner plans, and dinner plans turned into like really expensive, nice dinner plans in Philadelphia. And then dinner plans turned into wine nights at each other's places, and then that turned into vacations and road trips and gifts, and he would buy her so much luxury items and so many like handbags and jewelry and it became more romantic even though she wants to state that it didn't. Anne Marie's friends and roommate that she lived with basically said that you know why are you pursuing a married man and she was like I'm not pursuing a married man it's nothing romantic there's nothing going on and she denied absolutely everything but girl we all know. Thomas actually tried buying Anne Marie a new car and she obviously denied she was like no i don't i don't want a new car she doesn't want that like to be held against her and he also offered her uh, an apartment he was like if you move out with your friends you're old enough you need to have a place of your own i will pay for it every month just move out and move into this nice apartment let me provide for you and she also declined that offer so he was just like constantly pursuing her with money so based off of my opinion reading this it seemed as if like she was kind of treating Thomas as a sugar daddy like she didn't really picture him romantically even though it was romantic she didn't really picture like a boyfriend girlfriend turning to a wife and husband type of relationship one day it was mainly just like okay I'm giving him what he wants and he's giving me money in return and we're keeping it on the down low it's secret so I think that she was thinking more of him as a sugar daddy because of the age difference but that's just my opinion. I don't know. It also just kind of seems like that. So earlier I mentioned that she had kind of started developing an eating disorder at a young age. This followed her into adulthood. She still struggled with that because it was never treated. And she didn't really open up to anybody about that, but she did open up to Tom about it. Thomas was a really big part of her life and he would email her and constantly remind her to, to make sure that she's eaten. If she hasn't eaten, can you come and buy her lunch and bring her lunch to work? And, you know, he was really worried about her and always tried to, you know, help her with this eating disorder. And so she felt comfort in him because he was just so, just so helpful and constantly like, you know, giving attention to her about this. Although he seemed very kind and he was buying her all these gifts, he was very manipulative and he held, a, he held the gifts and the expensive like things that he would do for her over her head all the time and was just really manipulative. He used everything that he did against her. In 1995, Anne Marie's brother introduced Anne Marie to a man named Michael and no one knew about Thomas and Anne Marie's relationship because it was obviously secret. So the brother had no idea about Thomas, but she decided, hey, since that's secretive, I'm gonna go on a date with Michael and I'm just gonna see how it goes. Whenever she first met Michael, she thought he was very kind and she was like, yeah, let's go on a date. Let's just see where this goes and she actually fell in love with him really fast. Michael was a banker, he was financially stable, their personalities clicked really well, and she really enjoyed being in a relationship with him. She really loved Michael. So because of this, Anne-Marie started to exclusively see Michael, but she hadn't officially broke things off with Thomas yet or told Thomas about Michael. And at the end of 1995, Thomas decided he was gonna sit Anne-Marie down and tell her 
I'm going to leave my wife for you. Like, I'm done with my marriage, I want you. And Anne Marie did not like this at all. She was appalled. For some reason, she was okay with being a mistress, but she was not okay with the fact that she would feel so guilty knowing that Thomas left his wife for her. She did not like that that weight on her shoulders and she told Tom, she told Thomas to like not go with it. I'm kind of going back and forth between Tom and Thomas. So just know Tom and Thomas is the same person. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm doing that. I don't know. Either way, she told Thomas, please don't do this. Like, don't break it off with your wife. Because of Thomas wanting to call things off with his wife, she just decided, I'm just going to end this completely. I don't want to be a mistress anymore. I don't, I don't want to be with you anymore. Let's just break up. And he did not take this well at all. He absolutely, like, lost his shit. He grabbed her by the throat and... He started yelling really derogatory things at her and it's absolutely unacceptable what she's doing and she's gonna regret it. He was just overall really aggressive and Anne-Marie sat her friends down and basically explained like he's aggressive, I don't feel like I don't feel comfortable around him anymore. I kind of fear my life being around him now. Obviously this is a, a good thing to say to people when it comes to like future references which we'll get into, sorry. Well, after the breakup, Tom would sit outside of Anne-Marie's apartment and just wait for her to come home or leave the apartment. And he just became obsessed with her. He would call her constantly, give her emails all the time. And obviously he never got a reply back or an, a call back. And he was just obsessed with winning Anne-Marie back. He once like barged into the apartment that she was living at with her roommates and threatened her to give him all of his gifts that he had given her back and started to like take the gifts and it was just a big commotion but um it didn't really say if he got the gifts back or if she kept them but it you know that's just what happened he just said that he wanted the gifts back so although thomas had explained to Anne marie that he wanted to leave his wife and they broke up because of it he still decided i'm still gonna leave my wife not for Anne marie but just just leave her in general. Thomas eventually calmed down and stopped being obsessive and it almost seemed as if he was trying to completely restart the cycle of winning Anne-Marie and pursuing her the way he had first done it. He would send her really sweet emails, he would invite her to lunch dates or dinner dates and just wait for answers and he just wanted her so bad and she really wasn't completely over him. She had spent two years with him and because she started seeing somebody else, she had to break it off without really like giving her some time to get over him before pursuing another relationship. So she was still really emotionally attached to Tom, but she was also really scared of him. She didn't really know what he was capable of. And it was just a really bad situation that she was in because she was just so emotionally attached to Tom, but she really loved Michael and she loved the relationship that she had with Michael and she just, you know, she was just stuck in a really weird love triangle. Because of the wanting to be with both men, it caused a lot of anxiety and stress on her. And whenever you have um, a lot of stress or you're just really anxious, this kind of causes um, an eating disorder to flare up in which it did. She went all day and night and for a few days without eating and she actually passed out at work one day whenever somebody told her to call somebody to come and pick her up she didn't call michael she called thomas so the reason why she called thomas was um because she hadn't even explained to michael her eating disorder she only opened up to, to tom about it so whenever she fainted the only person that she could really think of to come and get her was thomas so this was the first time she had seen thomas in a while and this kind of sparked like another romantic beginning to them. They started going back to lunch dates and dinner dates and the cycle just restarted. And she was just hanging out with Thomas all the time, even though she was still in a relationship with Michael. This was just really emotional though. It was more like a friendship. It was just a rekindling of the friendship. It was nothing romantic or sexual. And in May of 1996 is when she decided she was gonna end things with Tom completely. So Anne-Marie had a diary that she collectively uh, put her thoughts into and would write down all of her emotions and feelings. And she talked about Thomas being very manipulative and 
just jealous and obsessive and she just couldn't take it anymore. She wanted him out of her life completely. She should have never gotten involved with him and a married man and you know just explaining that she just wanted out of the relationship. So because of this she started to slowly decline the lunch date. She declined the dinner dates and would kind of slowly drift off from answering every single email to only answering a few to then none. She was slowly slowly distancing herself from Thomas so that he wouldn't act aggressively whenever you know she wanted to break things off with him. She wasn't going to go straight to the point. She was just going to do it slowly so maybe he would kind of get the hint and be like okay like I need you know I don't want Anne Marie anymore. This was her thought process. Sadly however on June 27th 1996 this would be the last dinner date that they were ever go on. The dinner she was basically basically going to sit him down and face to face tell him, I need you to stop pursuing me. I'm with Michael. I really don't want anything else with you. I don't want uh, um, any involvement, like emotionally, physically. I don't, I don't want to be with you anymore. She's basically just going to break up with him because he still wasn't getting the hint with the emails and not replying. So she was just really stressed out about the dinner. And the waitress that had waited on them that night said that the dinner was very tense. It just seemed like they were very unhappy and they barely touched their food. They got some to-go boxes and then they left. She asked Thomas to drive her home and he did not drive her back to her house. He drove her back to his house. And this is where he sadly took a gun and shot her through her left ear and killed her. He then placed her very tall five foot 10 body into a cooler and realized that she wasn't gonna fit so he broke her legs so that she was able to fit into the cooler. He put her body that was in the cooler in his garage and he basically chained up the cooler uh, with very heavy metal chains. This is whenever he returned to Anne Marie's apartment and he had taken the dress that she had worn her shoes and placed it over her chair in her bedroom. He placed her purse with her wallet and her leftovers on the kitchen counter just basically set the stage. As he was walking out, he locked her door with her key. The next morning after setting up the stage and killing her, he persuaded his brother who had a boat to help him dispose of Anne Marie's body into the Atlantic Ocean. And this was about 60 miles off the New Jersey coast. So um, it was gonna be kind of far out and he was just gonna like get rid of her body. He didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And so his brother helped him. Thomas then went home and disposed of the sofa and the rug where um, the whole incident had taken place and threw that into the dumpster. And um, it didn't really say if this was kind of like a big thing in the case because it didn't have any like receipts of a new purchase of a sofa or a rug. So, you know, he thought that he had disposed of all of the um, evidence properly. But three days after the dinner, so June 30th, she was supposed to attend a dinner with her family and obviously she didn't show up and so the family got really worried and filed a missing person report because she wasn't answering her phone, she wasn't answering any emails or anything like that. So they got really worried and investigation started because of this missing person report. Obviously police started the investigation and had to figure out some suspects and because Thomas was the last one to see Anne Marie. They were like, hey, we're gonna have him as a suspect. And they did some digging and he was the primary suspect and there was no body. So it was really hard to convict him of a murder. But you know, they went and they were gonna talk to Thomas about everything. They had to basically theorize what happened with this case. Several months before the planned dinner that Thomas had, he had asked his other mistress, Deborah, remember her, to purchase a gun for him. Deborah was, she didn't really know why. She asked him why. He said that he was being harassed and he needed a gun for his protection because he was scared that they were gonna kill him. And of course, Deborah, who, has had a relationship with this man for 15 years was like, oh my God, yeah. So she bought him a gun and gave it to him. So again, with the scene that was set up with the apartment, it basically explained that Thomas did drop her off, like her dress and her stuff and like all of her stuff is there. So he dropped her off at the apartment, then went home. So he has no idea where she is. And this was trying, this was basically trying to be like his alibi and obviously it didn't work. So this is when he called his brother, asked him to use his boat to dispose of the body, but come to the conclusion that the body, even though it was in the cooler and the chains, it didn't sink when they had tossed it into the ocean. It kind of stayed afloat. 
So they picked the cooler up out of the ocean, they took Anne Marie's body out of there, shot a few bullet holes in the cooler, and put her back with two anchors that were in the boat into the cooler, then rechained it and then tossed it and it sank. A fisherman eventually somehow found this cooler with bullet holes in it. I don't, I, I'm stuck on this because I don't exactly know if this is the same cooler with the bullet holes because the cooler that was taken into the police didn't have Anne Marie's body in it. Like, I, I have this weird feeling that like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to think because if, the fisherman found that exact cooler, her body should be in it. So I'm thinking this is a completely different cooler, but I don't know. That's just my theory. When police started to search Thomas's home because they believed he was the primary suspect, they found two very small drops of blood in his living room, basically where the couch and the rug were. Thomas thought that he had disposed of all of the evidence, but this, the blood that was on there did match Anne Marie's. So because of this, Thomas was arrested and taken into custody. So while he was in jail awaiting his trial, he was stupid. He started talking to an inmate about if he had known anybody that could possibly kill somebody for him because he wanted to kill Deborah because he found out that she was testifying against him. It was a very good prisoner who was an informant who explained to the police that, hey, this is what Thomas just said to me. It's kind of sketchy. So this helped the prosecution get more dirt on his case. And this actually gave a lot of protection to Deborah before the trial, just in case, you know, he had talked to another inmate. So on October 26, 1998 is whenever Thomas's trial started. And this, he, there were so many friends and family that testified against him. And this was just really big pivotal like witnesses in the case. It was almost alarming how many people testified against him that were in his life. So this helped obviously the prosecution tremendously. And it kind of took a turn whenever Thomas went against his lawyer's wishes and took the stand. Thomas made up this like bullshit story. He explained that Deborah had called the night of the dinner he said that he had company over so he couldn't meet up with her that night, but she still showed up to his place anyways. Because of this, she saw Anne-Marie and she freaked out. She was mentally erratic and pulled out a gun from her purse and he was scared that she was gonna kill herself because she had explained that she wanted to commit suicide before. So whenever he went to go grab the gun, it, it went off and it killed Anne-Marie in the living room who had stood up to leave. He was in so much shock that he didn't call the police. He was like, I need to dispose the body of myself. And he explained that Deborah helped him dispose of the body into the cooler and get it into the garage so that Deborah was not as innocent as she seemed on the witness stand. Nobody really bought this story. Thankfully, the jury was like, yeah, that's, that's bullshit. Sorry. On January 18th, 1999, the jury found him guilty of first degree murder for the death of Anne-Marie Fahey and he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. And it it was a really weird case because they didn't have a body and the, the gun, you know, that was shot to kill Anne-Marie was not present. The murder weapon was not a part of this case with evidence at all. So it was really hard to do so, like, and convict somebody of murdering somebody with no body and no murder weapon. Like, just like last week's video with Richard, with the death of, death of his wife, there, I mean, they kind of had the, um, the murder weapon, but they didn't have a body, but they still convicted Richard um, of killing his wife without a body. It's really hard to do that if you don't have a body because you don't know the the cause of death and all this. Like it's just it's just hard because of DNA, everything, everything. It's really hard. So for them, the jury to be smart enough to convict him for that, like applause. However, a writ of certiorari was sent to the Supreme Court who basically overturned the lethal injection. They did not want another capital punishment for the state and so he was re-sentenced to life in prison. A writ of certiorari is basically when an appellate court wants a review of a case so they send it to the Supreme Court to basically have them like look over it and if they need to change anything with sentencing and stuff like that they can and so that's what that is so if y'all didn't know that there's your fact of the day on september 19th 2011 thomas was found dead in his prison cell because of cardiac arrest and obesity so he did spend his life in prison even though it was not a long life this crime was kind of almost the perfect crime if we're being honest because the way he had set up her apartment there was no signs of struggle 
you know, signs of struggle in his apartment and there was really no evidence, if we're being honest, if it wasn't for the key witnesses in this case or the two little small drops of blood, that's really all they had to go off of in stories. Like that's what's crazy about this case is this man, you know, I 100% I believe that he did it, but just in case he didn't, like that's kind of a lot to convict a person of with such little evidence and really minor evidence too. And because of the murder weapon, Thomas didn't explain where he had placed the gun. Deborah explained that she did not receive the gun back. So because of the murder weapon, they just, somebody's lying and somebody's, you know, keeping something from somebody, but they didn't, they weren't able to convict him with the murder weapon because of that. So it's just weird. What really gets to me about this case is that like, Thomas didn't come from a bad home life. His family was wealthy, he was spoiled. I mean, I guess that can kind of increase like narcissistic personality is whenever you're just like really into yourself because you basically have everything that you want and obviously narcissists are very manipulative and insecure in their own ways so i think that you know because he was so overly obsessed that and also because he was wealthy he thought that maybe he could get by with innocence like he thought he was off the hook but obviously that's not true i don't know this whole story is just what the hell? Let me give you some advice. Don't get involved with married men or men don't get involved with married women. Just be faithful. Don't do all this BS because scandals, love affairs, heartbreak, murder. That's it for today's video. If you enjoyed, make sure you give this video a like and tell your friends. Also, subscribe to my channel if you like true crime. Just comment down below what you believe like your opinion is on this case if you believe he's innocent if you believe he's guilty what stuck out to you the most what was crazy about this case just just comment what you feel okay just do whatever you want make sure you turn on the notification bell so you never miss an upload even though i do upload every single thursday and i will see you guys next thursday thank you guys so much for watching bye